this scheme. Okay, so this is a recent simulation using, again, the console on my postdoc. Here's this Lucio. Um, there's a particle accelerating to the right. There's a middle horizon, and you can see there are more only waves in front than behind, so it's pushing it back against this acceleration. So this explains inertial mass. People have just assumed that things keep going at constant speed. They, they have not particularly asked why that is. So this, this explains that. But that's not the whole story. <clears throat> um, there's also the cosmic horizon, which is where the centre of our universe, as you look further and further away, stars are moving away more rapidly until eventually they're moving at the speed of light. And then you get the cosmic horizon. Um, it's very far away, 10 to the 26 metres away, which has an effect. But now, as well as a horizon on this side, we've also got a horizon on this side, damping a few of these waves. So it makes the, the process that I've just outlined for inertial mass less efficient. It messes it up a little bit. Um, so, to recap, we have an object with fast acceleration, sees only waves in front of it, a wind horizon behind precludes any other waves, it stops them behind it. If you have a very slowly accelerating object, the other waves are very long, and now they see the, the Hubble horizon all around. And this is spherically symmetric, um, so you can't get this sort of a, an imbalance. And you, so this predicts that inertial mass should disappear for very low accelerations. Luckily, that's just what we need for to explain galaxy rotation. In the centre, they are accelerating, the stars are accelerating rapidly, uh, and physics behaves normally. At exactly the radius, when you go out from the centre, at exactly the radius where the acceleration gets so low, that only waves become as long as the cosmic horizon. At exactly that point, the galaxies start to misbehave, which is a clear smoking gun for inertial, uh, for only radiation. Um, and this is exactly what we want. We have too much centrifugal force at the edge. This comes from inertial mass, so the, the model I've just described uh, reduces this, so it's just, uh, just exactly right to balance the gravitational force. So the, the formula you can write down from this, and I won't drive it here, I'll just write it down, is that the modified inertial mass is equal to the original one times this factor, so 1 minus 2 times the speed of light squared divided by the acceleration of the object times the cosmic um, horizon, the diameter of the cosmos. Um, so the first thing to notice about this is it's very simple and there's nothing that can be adjusted. Um, everything here is known, so speed of light, acceleration, <coughs> the cosmic uh, diameter is known. Um, so there's no way I can, I can fiddle it or adjust it. How do you find it if that's a different term? Two square over a. How do I. How do you find it as a different term? How do you deduce it? Ah, I could show you the derivation. It comes straight from the Heisenberg and Sonder principle. I may not have time to show it, that's when. But I have the slides here, I can show you. Um, so if you put this formula into Newton's second law as the inertial mass and add the gravitational law, you get something like this. And you're probably familiar with this part of it, so the acceleration is equal to the gravitational one. But now there's a new term which is independent, uh, well, it's 2c squared over the Hubble diameter. The great thing is that this is independent of uh, mass, so the equivalence principle is intact, so it doesn't violate that. Uh, the second great thing is that this is the size of the cosmic acceleration that was discovered in 1999. It's the same, the same size, so it predicts it. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that I've applied it to 153 galaxies. Um, and this is a summary of the data. So here we have um, the expected acceleration of the galaxy, if you like it to spin. This is the observed acceleration, what we actually see it, at the rate at which you see it spinning. If Newton was correct, uh, then of course we'd have all the data, which is the the grey squares along the diagonal. Uh, but for low accelerations, they're all shifted up because the observed spin is greater than the expected one. And that's the galaxy rotation problem. Uh, the model, so quantized inertia when you derive the formula for lo velocity, <coughs> says that velocity, the edge of the galaxy, is two times g, the visible mass of the galaxy. There's no dark matter here. 
times c squared over the whole distance. And it's this dashed line here, so it agrees perfectly with the data without any tuning. Um, so the great thing about this is that there's only one answer, um, and it's, it's a correct one. Okay, so it seems to work on an astrophysical scale, and I've modeled white binaries to fly by and all the other things as well. <clears throat> the difficulty is, um, I'm, I'm fairly confident about the theory on an astrophysical scale, the difficulty is bringing it down to the lab scale and making it usable as a thrust mechanism. That's where the real difficulty um, lies. But it means that if we understand inertia, then we can control it. Um, so, imagine if you have a very highly accelerated object, it sees under waves which are quite short, uh, a component of the under waves is electromagnetic, and then you put a damper above the object, it will, um, it will damp some of these under waves, especially if you put it at the anti-node of the wave, where it will damp it most effectively. And then the under waves from below will push up, there will be nothing pushing it down, and so it will, it will rise up, there will be a thrust. And if you notice, there's no propellant being uh, pushed downwards. This is a thrust that's using um, the quantum vacuum uh, instead of expelling material. So it's, it's quite a naughty thing. OK, so the Casimir effect, I believe, is a very tiny example of this. So that's been mentioned quite a lot today. So we have two plates. Uh, zero point field is very strong outside. It's, it's weaker inside, so the plates get pushed together. What would happen if you had a V-shape, um, so a place like this, um, and Sonny alluded to this in his talk as well, then you would have a lot of um, waves outside, fewer inside, and so there should be a force pushing it towards the open end. And in fact, from an oceanographic point of view, I've had students build this, and they put it in the wave tank, <coughs> and show that objects like this do move towards that open end. Um, what would happen now if instead you intensified the vacuum, the quantum vacuum, inside the V. Now these, these waves will be pushing outwards and there will be a thrust towards a narrow end. Well, something a bit like that has been seen recently, and it's very controversial, but it's the M-drive. So this was um, discovered or found by Roger J. J. Scheuer, who's shown here, a satellite engineer. He had uh, truncated copper cones like this. He resonated microwaves within them and he measured a very small thrust uh, towards a narrow end. Um, and Howard White as well has, has measured a similar um, effect at NASA. So this could be an experimental error. That's the danger of getting involved with lab experiments, uh, that these could be errors. But <coughs> no one has yet identified a specific error that it is. So um, I became intrigued by the M-drive and tried to see if I could uh, predict it. Um, Quantized inertia can predict it quite well. Um, and the reason is that um, when the microwaves are put into the cavity, they bounce around very fast. Their acceleration is very large, so the under waves are short enough to actually interact with the cavity. More of them are allowed at the wide end than at the narrow end, so the distance is wider. So you get more under waves here, Fewer here, so you get an under wave um, gradient, if you like, pushing the M drive <coughs> towards the narrow end. Um, so, this predicts it, well, you can, you can judge for yourself. Um, these are all the tests that have been done by Scheuer, um, there was an American team, about a Carnai drive, a few initial NASA experiments, and then NASA published a, a paper in 2016 and I've averaged their first their three thrust measurements. Um, so this is the observed thrust in millinewtons, and this is a predicted one. I suppose the most embarrassing thing is that I'm predicting a, a negative, where there should be a positive there. It's, it's about the right size, but a bit negative. But I have some difficulty understanding Scheuer's papers. He sometimes mixes up the react direction of reaction and the direction of acceleration, so it could be that I've simply misunderstood his, his paper. But I published this in, in this paper here. Martin Tasman was good. Uh, Tymar uh, is now saying that he didn't, didn't measure it, so I have I crossed him out. 
So, of course, there's uh, Jim Woodward and Heidi Fern in uh, California who have been measuring um, what's called the Woodward effect or the Mac effect uh, thrust. And I have a, a way to explain this uh, in the context of quantized measure 2. Um, this is very similar in that they've got a highly accelerated system within, within an asymmetric cavity. Um, so this piezoelectric vibrates very fast. Um, then what I'm assuming is that the, the large bus cap damps other waves, but the thin bus cap doesn't, which, which makes kind of sense. Um, so there'll be more other waves on this side than on this side, and it will shift uh, to, the, to the left. And it picks it, well, in this case, quite well. This was a, an experiment done by Hoon in 1999. And they found they measured 50 micronewtons of thrust, and I predict 24 micronewtons of thrust. Publish that in this paper here. Then there's also some experiments done by NASA using asymmetric capacitors. So they had a uh, capacitor with a thick plate and a thin plate. They put about 44,000 volts into it. They saw an electric discharge and it moved towards the towards thick plate. Um, and they observed a thrust of 14 millimeters. This was in a vacuum, by the way, so it's not ion drift. Um, I put it 13.3 for that. Uh, so again, you can see this paper. Um, okay, so if it's true that quantized inertia produces thrust in this way, what does that mean for interstellar travel? Well, I've taken the case study that you want to accelerate from one year to half the speed of light. So you need an acceleration like that. Travel at half the speed of light for 7.4 Earth years. We select again um, the approxima, um, and that will get you there in just under 10 years. Um, can the M drive do it? Well, I've taken some examples of, of mass, I've calculated the mass of the spacecraft. So you have six people, 500 kilograms. Um, uh, this is a food for 10 years, water for 10 years. The structure I based that on the, the space station, the International Space Station. Um, Total is this. So, to accelerate to half the speed of light in one year, you need this amount of force. Uh, the M drive provides this amount of force, which is quite, quite small. So, you need 29 um, gigawatts, which is quite a lot. Um, but, uh, quantized inertia offers a way to enhance this. Um, the predictive formula for the force, thrust force and quantized inertia, looks like this. You've got the force, here's the power you put into this. Um, Cavity, the Q factor of the cavity, the number of times that, uh, the things bounce around inside the cavity, divided by the speed of light. Um, you can so you can enhance the thrust by either boosting the power, um, and it turns out that if you can put 1.2 uh, megawatts in, you can get levitation, but your cavity would melt first. Um, you can enhance the thrust by reducing C in the formula. So. I'm suggesting in one of my papers that a dielectric could be put into the, the M drive, which would reduce the speed of light. Or you can enhance thrust by boosting Q. And an American called Travis Taylor um, found out about quantized inertia and he pointed out in 2017 that uh, quantized inertia implies that an M drive using visible light would be a thousand times more effective. Um, so this is him. And this is his paper in a, a brilliant journal called Javis. Um, and this is his proposal for... Um, uh, so there's a game medium in here. And the reason for this is that they can now make very effective uh, super mirrors. So you can put light in with a light on the side <coughs> into the game medium. And it will bounce around quite happily uh, thousands, millions of times between the super mirrors. Which... Um, increases the Q factor, the number of times the um, information bounces around, by a thousand times. Um, so if you assume this, then um, the Taylor drive gives you about 150 newtons per kilowatt. So you'd only need about 13 megawatts to, uh, to power such a thing. Okay, so... Um, So, of course, because I've done 
connectivity, you can get to um, Oxfam Centauri if the system is correct. In 9.4 years, 8.1 years passes on the ship, which is a bit of a benefit. So, um, I, I was contacted by, by DARPA a couple of years ago, um, who were interested in my, my work, and I applied for some funding, and I, I won some $1.3 million. And um, they're very keen for me to make quantized notion more predictive, more exact. So what they're hoping I will do is to make myself obsolete by producing a computer model that will predict uh, what's going to happen in any circumstance, uh, which I'm happy to do. Um, and then to demonstrate the capability of quantized inertia to, to counter gravity or launch, launch things. So this doesn't mean actually uh, launching something, but simply demonstrate that the thrust seen in these experiments is due to quantized inertia and that it is scalable, so it can be enhanced enough to, uh, to launch things. Um, so I put up a team, um, it's a team at the University of Plymouth, obviously me, my postdoc, Jesus Lucio, uh, Martin Timar uh, kindly came on board um, with his, his team and a professor at the um, University of Alcala, Perez Diaz, uh, also joined, has joined in. So at Plymouth we're refining the model and building the theoretical uh, modeling using COMSOL. Martin Timar and um, Jose Lewis are going to do two different experiments. Uh, so the experiments in Madrid, um, all the experiments are just getting going, but so far he's um, suspended a laser loop from the pendulum um, and he's putting a, a laser light in, there are uh, 2,000 coils to this loop and he's using an interferometer to measure the, um, the position of this, this laser loop and trying to see if there's any thrust from this, this laser. Um, the original idea was for him to put a shield on one side of the loop. So the idea here is that the light goes around very fast, it sees other waves short enough to interact with this metal shield. There'll be fewer other waves on this side than on this side, so it should move to the left. Um, before he's going to do that, he's trying uh, his own idea, which is to have an asymmetric shape to the loop, uh, which he thinks might work. Um, uh, so he has uh, the predicted thrust from quantized measures by Michael Newton. And he's observed some thrust, but I'm, I'm not convinced yet that there's uh, anything to do with quantized inertia. It could be many, many things so far, so we need to clean up the experiment. Um, and then Martin Timer is um, uh, going to try the uh, Travis Taylor experiment using the super mirrors. And I got into trouble last week for um, putting one of the cavities, a picture of one of the cavities he's built on Twitter. So I, I can't show you a picture of, of his cavity, which is uh, quite, quite beautiful. Um, but it looks something like this. So uh, there's a laser input into the cavity. It goes around its it's kind of a, a spherical shape. And it has walls, and one of the walls is thicker than the others. So again, this is a highly energetic uh, system within an asymmetric uh, conducting um, uh, structure. So he's going to try and do that experiment. Okay, so I'm nearly finished, um, but I, I thought I couldn't come to an interstellar conference without saying something that I've been trying to publish for a long, a long time, um, is that quantized inertia may have something to say about uh, faster than light travel. Um, so, normally in relativity, special relativity, you speed things up, you try and approach the speed of light, the inertial mass goes up, and so you get to a kind of maximum speed, because the inertial mass is so great you can't push it any, any faster. Um, the thing about quantized inertia is that you can't have a constant velocity, there has to be a minimum acceleration, because if you have a constant velocity, the only waves become larger than the observable universe, and so they're disallowed. So, so to do this mathematically, you can write down the quantized inertia equation, uh, put in the special relativist, <coughs> relativistic formula as well, and if you do the math, you get this, that the acceleration is equal to the normal relativistic term. So, as you all know, 
if v equals c, this turns out to be 1, so we get 1 minus 1, and we get 0 for this term. So it doesn't matter how much force you put in, you'll get 0 acceleration in a normal special relativity. But with quantized inertia added in, you get an extra term here, uh, which is uh, immune to the effects of, of relativity. Um, now, this is very small, this acceleration. It's about 10 to the minus 10 meters per second per second. Uh, so it's not going to win any races. Um, but the interesting thing about this formula is this, this term here. This represents a cosmic uh, diameter. What if we could build a, um, a shell, uh, an information um, horizon around mm -hmm. the ship? Um, and it turns out you can do things like that using metamaterials. Uh, these are things that have been recently invented. And they can bend light in various uh, exotic ways. So if you had a spaceship, inside a metamaterial shell, then it may show a much larger acceleration that would be immune <coughs> to the effects of relativity. Uh, so I'm presenting this as a, a speculation, this last part. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, in a sense, it's a bit like the, uh, the Alcubierre drive, who's using curved space to do a very similar thing. Um, but this is using quantum mechanics and relativity instead. Okay, so, I published this actually in a, a paper again in Jabez in 2008. Um, most of this paper is now obsolete, except for the last bit, section 4, where I discussed this, uh, this proposal. So, to conclude. Um, so, quantized inertia is well proven now on astrophysical scales. Um, I can predict galaxies of many different sizes, from dwarf galaxies to galaxy clusters, flyby anomalies and other things. And it suggests propellantless thrust um, that you can, you can get by energizing the vacuum and adding a horizon. Um, the horizon is making the, the quantum vacuum non inhomogeneous in space, so objects start to move down the slope, if you like. Um, um, this uh, quantized measure also predicts some of the thrust anomalies that have been seen, like the M drive or the Woodward drive. Um, and as I said, I've been funded by DARPA to, to look into this a bit more. So, you may be interested in my blog, Physics from the Age. And I'm on Twitter as well. And I gave a TED, TEDx talk uh, that you can find using Google with that title. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, we have one more talk. Uh, while we're swapping out computers, we're going to be bringing in, uh, utilizing